I'm Danielle Kamara. Welcome to the 2024 Festival of Books. The festival organizers thank Louis Roca and O'Reilly Chevrolet for sponsoring this location, and Joanne and Howie Adams and the Friends of the Fen Festival for sponsoring the upcoming discussion. The panel will end in one hour. We'll have 15 to 20 minutes for Q&A near the end of the session. Make sure to stop by the book sales area and author signing at Sales and Signing Area, area Integrated Learning Center after the session. Book sales at the festival help support the cost of the festival and the local literacy programs it funds. You can also help keep this event free and open to everyone by becoming a friend of the festival or a sponsor of the festival. Please stop by the Friends booth or visit our website, tucsonfestivalbooks.org. As we begin, please silence your phones. Joining us today for the panel, Extremes of Life Online, are Jeff Horwitz and Taylor Lorenz. Jeff Horwitz is an award-winning technology reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He was behind the investigative reporting that led to the Facebook Files, a series of damning reports that showed some of Facebook's most harmful effects and that the company knew about them and chose not to fix them. He's the author of Broken Code, <clears throat> and Taylor Lorenz is a technology columnist for the Washington Post covering online culture and the content creator industry. She was previously a technology reporter for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and The Daily Beast, and has written for many more publications. And she's the author of Extremely Online. Um, so first of all, could each of you, I'm sure some people here have read the books, but for those that haven't, could each of you just give us like an elevator pitch for the book, just kind of the basics of what it's about? Sure, I'll start. Um, oops, sorry to talk, <laughs> talk loud because I'm uh, sort of um, My book is uh, about sort of the rise of the online content creator economy, the influencer industry, which is what I've covered for a long time. So it really charts the rise of the influencer world from sort of the beginning, from the turn of the millennium to around 2020. Uh, my book came out of, um, so as a reporter, um, probably my strongest suit is that um, I'm a weasel to whom people want to give documents. And uh, in the case of Meta, um, that involved uh, 20,000 odd pages of internal work product provided to me by Francis Haugen, who was um, uh, a, an employee of Facebook who um, ultimately uh, decided that the company that there were things that the company knew internally that needed to be understood externally. So my book is sort of a um, description of how the company came to understand what societal effects were and the ways in which it was shifting and uh, distorting human behavior um, and uh, how it chose to respond to uh, those internal discoveries and uh, obviously if it had uh, come clean about them, I would not have a book on the subject. So, um, so that's that's kind of I'd say in terms of the relation here. Um, uh, I spent a lot of time on the plumbing that the people that Taylor focuses on um, have gotten very good at manipulating to their own advantage. Ideally, when they do well. Um, I just want to make sure. Can everybody hear all three of us? Okay. No. All right. No. Okay. No. Louder or closer um, to the mic. Yeah, right. Okay, okay. That's great. why I was wondering if Jeff was on. Okay, great. Um, okay, so both of your books talk about the ways that social media and the online world has, in a lot of ways, unfolded unchecked. Um, and so, can you each talk about some of the ways that social media platforms have either caused damage or changed society, both willfully and out of ignorance? Oh my God. Well, I'm sure both of us can talk for hours on this. Um, I mean. My, um, a lot of my book focuses more on sort of like the user side. So I think um, social media has facilitated the rise of this half a trillion dollar content creator industry, which has disrupted media and transformed the entertainment ecosystem. But it's also dismantled every single waiver protection that used to come along with those industries. So, um, you know, you're sort of, it, it's basically created in a lot of jobs, um, not just the influencer jobs themselves, but the sort of jobs around them, ch child influencers specifically. You know, it used to be that when you um, 
were famous or you were on a TV show, you know, it, there were all these rules. There's the, um, you know, you have to be in school a certain amount of hours. You have to, your, the money needs to be set aside for you. Now we have an industry of family bloggers that just basically, you know, record their kids for content all day and the streets have no protection. So that's just one example of, you know, I think the broader problems with this brand new uh, industry that has nothing around it. And the tech companies have, of course, made no effort to kind of um, protect the, the creators that, that build these businesses. We're talking about the creator economy and success on Instagram and Facebook. Um, I think uh, just looking at the platform and what the platform understands about itself internally. Um, first is creating novel content that is creative and original is an absolute loser move. Um, the, uh, this has been a problem for a long time inside the platform, uh, inside both Facebook and Instagram. Um, the uh, single easiest way uh, to succeed on the platform is not the uh, producing novel content yourself because most of that stuff fails. Um, it's to um, uh, either steal, as in directly lift from another uh, website viral video, or it's to duplicate uh, you know, some trend uh, as quickly as possible and just sort of hop in on um, whatever the algorithm is understood to be rewarding uh, at any given moment. And so this is kind of an adversarial thing. Uh, for you know, Internally at Meta, this was a great problem for a long time. Their partnerships team, the people who like liaised with uh, celebrities of the offline sort and even of the online sort would go to these meetings with um, you know, uh, A-list actresses and say, you know, like, here are our tips for content creation. You gotta post regularly, you gotta be novel stuff, really should be personal. You know, not like anything else you're seeing, and the uh, representatives of said actress would uh, would say like, why is my client, one of the most famous women in the world, getting outdone by accounts that collect dirt bike crashes, uh, compilation videos, and there was no answer to that question, right? Uh, the uh, the partnership team had a very hard job, um, and. Um, I mean, for the people who actually are trying to ride it, it's an extremely fickle thing. Um, the uh, changes in the algorithm will overnight, um, you know, render certain tactics um, completely, you know, useless, uh, completely untransparent, and um, it really does reward uh, things that are ultra aggressive and sometimes even like actively irritating like there's this is a i occasionally go fishing and there's you can either try to catch a fish by you know having something really delicious on the line or by having something that's so irritating the fish bites it uh this is actually a, you know trout lures work this way and um that is actually a really successful strategy for online content creation which is like you do something that makes everyone respond with such horror, um, uh, you know, that's, you end up going viral because on every one of the platforms, they have slightly different systems for, you know, determining what rises to the top, but um, comments and reactions uh, are the same. Uh, you know, they are, are, are both high, are highly valued in every instance, and there's almost no negative feedback. This is something that internally at Meta you can tell Meta that you want to see more of a product in myriad ways. Telling them that you don't like it is near impossible. They've begun shifting that a little bit, but this is like, I think, to be thought of as a car that only has a gas pedal. So, okay, and then this next question is uh, mainly for Jeff. Um, just as far as like uh, some of the harms that Facebook has caused, and this is something that you go into in the book and, and that you uncovered in your investigative reporting, and maybe you could just touch on what some of the most egregious ones were, but something that really struck me in the book was how much um, Mark Zuckerberg would say that he was wanted the drive for engagement to be for the betterment of society, but time and time again, that did not seem to be the case, so what? was the driver. Um, you know, it seems like it would be to make money, but it's, is that what you found? Yeah, I think to, to sort of think about why Mark Zuckerberg runs, you know, the most important social media company in the world. Um, uh, I, you, pretty much probably everyone here would have failed in that guy's um, 
choose to do the same thing. And one of the reasons is because the this was a land grab. There was a, all of a sudden a brand new industry opened up, particularly with the arrival of, uh, of phones that were going to be with us constantly. Um, and uh, the way to succeed was to just very quantitatively, whatever change you made, if it upped usage of the platform, uh, you did it. Uh, and you tested, the tests you ran were maybe a week or two tops. You know, this is not, no one's looking for long-term effects, ecosystem questions, you know, sort of secondary, extra, no, like just did, did like, did physics the site go up? If so, ship it, as in you put it into the code. And so they just did that over and over and over again, and they were very good at it. Um, it's data-driven in the sense that, you know, just they will be running literally thousands of experiments to see what minor tweaks to the recommendation systems um, will produce you know, ever so slightly greater engagement. And I don't think they recognize their own importance uh, in this uh, because um, they certainly didn't recognize, at least until, say, late 2019, that all of the optimizing for engagement they were doing uh, tended to run directly contrary to any metric of quality or of like safety. So for example, um, uh, hostile speech, um, uh, hate speech would be something that um, uh, they were actively optimizing for. They weren't measuring it, but it turns out that hate speech is an extremely effective way to get attention. Um, uh, you know, you, it's the loudest, angriest guy at the party. Um, and offline life, we have good feedback that means that guy doesn't get invited to parties. Um, but uh, but Facebook did not. So you had you had polarization issues. Certainly, um, there were uh, on mental health um, very clear indications that the platform um, would. I mean, the company's line was, well, there were always glossy magazines featuring models that were too skinny. Um, you know, we all grew up with Kate Moss in, in my, my generation. Um, and uh, this is true. Uh, the thing that, um, you know, magazines did not do was realize that you'd spent a little bit too long looking at uh, a particular picture of a model who was, you know, emaciated and decide that that was a signal that they need to serve you way more of that content. Just shut it hard. Uh, and that's kind of what the platform does on just about everything. So you have this on politics. Uh, you have uh, you know the sort of most committed, loudest voices in the room um, are the ones that tend to succeed. Uh, this is a you know, thing that sort of doesn't have to be this way. But um, on Facebook, pretty much every interaction, and this is the same thing for Instagram, is worth about the same. Um, uh, so if Taylor likes 300 things over the course of a day and I like three, Taylor's going to have a hundred times the impact I do. It turns out that that is um, really not a great way of getting balanced discourse. So you'll have things with uh, you know people who have extremely radical uh, conspiratorial beliefs. They tend to be really active online. Uh, and uh, so the platform will basically promote that stuff super heavy, um, and uh, it's sort of just a kind of definitionally unbalanced, and almost intentionally so system. Uh, efforts to internally uh, rein that in to like say make it so that um, users would have a more equal impact on the platform, um, they pretty much always fail because they reduced usage. Yeah. Um, yeah, so both of you have talked a little bit about the ways that some of these platforms uh, manipulate users and also content creators, and I want to talk more about that, um, but I do want to bring up like a lot of the focus of your book, Taylor, is about the ways that um, social media in the digital world has kind of taken the power away from gatekeepers and put some power in the hands of users and content creators. And so can you talk about like some of the things that you wrote about in your book that um, users and in particular content creators, the way that they drove social media platforms to even out of business? 
Yeah, well, I think Vine is sort of the most notable um, example of content creators getting together and just kind of like, basically they were so angry at the way that the platform was treating them that, that all of the biggest content creators on that platform abandoned the platform, partially because Meta was recruiting them so hard and YouTube was recruiting them so hard and giving them so much money and Vine was owned by Twitter, which was enough to make a turn on that. But, um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, what I write a lot about is the change in the media ecosystem and our entertainment landscape. And, um, you know, in the past, there were these gatekeepers in media and in journalism and entertainment, Hollywood and stuff, you know, to be, uh, to get a show or whatever, right? You had to go through the casting process or to get published somewhere, you know, you had to be vetted by an editor. Obviously now everybody can sort of go directly through these platforms. And so I think the platforms have really become the new gatekeepers in terms of a lot of this stuff. And obviously they're very, um, they don't want to take on that responsibility. So they sort of just don't do their job of, um, you know, worrying so much about the content that people are putting out. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that it's led to a huge shift in media and information consumption and entertainment consumption as well, um, because now people are much more likely to get there's not as many centralized places to get information. People usually absorb information through a range of personalities online. Um, and so, you know, also like reading both of your books made me think that like, I don't know if everybody really understands like how much power some of these platforms have. Um, and so uh, I wonder if you could talk about first, Taylor, maybe um, a little bit about how creators have changed the consumer economy. like entirely and um, even I thought it was really interesting in the beginning of your book you talk about the mommy bloggers being like the OG influencers and how they really like changed women's media. Yeah well speaking of women's media I mean I um, as a millennial grew up in the aughts you know which is when these Gen X mothers really started to thrive around the turn of the century or oh my god millennium um, all the century, I guess. It was also um, yeah. <laughs> where, uh, you know, these Gen X mothers that were sort of shut out of the workforce started blogging online. A lot of the mothers specifically got, gained massive amounts of audiences by actually promoting a lot of feminist thought. And, um, you know, it wasn't like the trad wife influencer stuff we see today. They were actually saying, like, pretty progressive things about feminism. They were destigmatizing things like, you know, breastfeeding and um, just the, the way that we talk about kind of like the the struggles of motherhood is, is very much thanks to those women because glossy women's magazines at that time ignored postpartum depression, they ignored the fact that a lot of women like hate their husbands sometimes or whatever, you know? Um, and so these women were able to build these massive media empires. Um, it's interesting because they were sort of, they, they were the genesis of this entire content creator industry that was then really, it was like they, they sort of had this kindling and then social media came and it was like gasoline on that fire. So they started to monetize and build these media businesses that were very progressive and actually forced women's media to evolve in that time. Um, but then you had the social media platforms sort of recognize that and um, eventually, you know, kind of the, those industries merged. And now, I mean, what, what the content creator industry has done most specifically is really flip the marketing model on its head where initially, I mean, in the past, it was more like you would develop a product you would go out and then find an audience for that product and market that product. Now people much more develop the audience first and then figure out what to sell them. And so it's just a very different kind of business model. Um, yeah, and so another thing, and this is maybe, Jeff, you could start this off, it's mainly about Facebook, um, but it applies to the other platforms as well. Like it seemed like Facebook really didn't understand its algorithms. Like it was creating these algorithms, but it didn't, it didn't seem like it was aware of what it was doing until it was already, you know, had in important and, and heavy repercussions. Um, and I'll just mention one more thing about that, that uh, Zuckerberg, when he started Facebook, he said that uh, he thought that more connections would reduce hate, which I thought was really interesting when I saw that, because it seems like it's, oh, he thought that it would um, obliterate terrorism, which it seems like that's it was not gonna, it was going to address <laughs> it was going to address the conflict in the Middle East because people who were connected could not possibly hate each other. Uh, there may have been uh, an error in that calculation. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, yeah, and I mean, look, the, the company I think for a long time um, took not paying attention to what went viral on its platform to not only be an acceptable thing to do but almost a uh, a virtuous one. Uh, it was proof of their neutrality that they um, were just not even going to look at what was happening. 
and that would have been a um, perhaps a much more understandable position um, if the thing wasn't so damn easy to game. Um, you know, it turns out that uh, you know you could you could potentially, as I mean, I think some of the the creators you've written about really do like raw novel creative work uh, and succeed. You could also, um, let's say, if you were a fly by night news outlet, um, you could set up sixty different identical pages on Facebook uh, and cross promote the same link to all of them. Uh, and uh, basically mimic the signal of something bubbling up from the bottom that would be taken as proof that it should go viral. Uh, and uh, entire media companies were built on this, uh, most notably in partisan media. Uh, you know, there was a, um, was it a book, there was a, a entity called Western Journal, was basically formed out of 60 odd massive Facebook you know, trash meme accounts called like Trump Truck 2024, you know, things like that. Uh, which again, nothing against Trump Truck 2024, but like this was functionally cheating the system. Um, and um, walk me through the, the, the rest of your question. I think I lost, I think I lost um, the thread. There. Yeah, uh, I was talking about the ways that Facebook didn't really understand the repercussions of their algorithms, okay. even as it was playing out. Yeah, and so they they um, they did not really look. I, I mean, it took until the years in which they actually began looking at you know putting data scientists and engineers to like actually try to figure out what they were doing. That was 2017 through 2019, uh, and I think it's important to recognize that by 2017, the platform bore no resemblance to the original product. Uh, it was the guts of it had been completely ripped out. Um, and instead of like sort of putting at center the people that you chose to follow, it was using engagement signals. And uh, that um, was very effective at maximizing time spent uh, and was also very good for advertising, um, but it did not, um, it didn't really cover what even the users told the company they wanted. So for example, they'd say they wanted to hear from reliable news sources, things they recognized. Um, that ran directly contrary to what succeeded. And there were easy ways to rein some of this stuff in. I mean, for example, uh, you know, internally by even 2016, people had noted that if, let's say, you suppress traffic to websites, let's put it this way, the, the websites that derived all of their traffic from Facebook were pretty much always awful. Uh, if they didn't have some other way of getting traffic, this was a terrible thing. That, of course, is a hard thing to sell a take a Facebook senior leadership, that somehow your platform is uniquely good at steering traffic to fake information. Um, so they did the work. Uh, I think they demonstrated sort of where uh, um, the recommendation systems would tend to go awry. Um, and the problem was that by the time they realized this, there was no appetite to rein it in. Uh, this might sound hyperbolic, but um, uh, it, taking a hit to daily usage of even 0.1% uh, would have been off the table for any reason whatsoever. Doesn't matter whether it's like, you know, you could say uh, do a 50% reduction in misinformation involving politics not worth it for a 0.1% hit to usage. Uh, that is just, um, it was just inviolate. And so changing the platform at that point was sort of a dead letter because it had been optimized for engagement and therefore like so thoroughly at that point that anything alternate was going to um, take away from that. Uh, and uh, therefore like the safety people were sort of locked out of decision making. One, one other thing that kind of touches on the last thing Taylor mentioned just in terms of novel content is that this has been a thing that has been internally adopted and documented at Meta for years and I still find fascinating. Uh, it turns out all of us are very negligent in content production these days. Um, it used to be that Facebook and Instagram, everyone posted, everyone consumed posts. Um, that model has all but died. Um, among uh, affluent, uh, 
affluent white teenagers were sort of the canary in the coal mine. By 2017, they were completely off of Facebook, didn't post at all, most they were, and on Instagram, they were di dialing back hard. Uh, and that has just sort of, that trend has accelerated. For a while, they fought against it. There are a number of levers you can pull. Uh, it turns out if enough people like your posts, you'll post more, and so they were doing their best to sort of get people to produce content rather than just consume it. Uh, but at this point, it's like the whole influencer economy is getting to be an increasingly narrow uh, pyramid uh, in which there's basically no base, there's just the people who are massive winners and like nothing. Uh, I think my favorite example of this one uh, is like Ryan Reviews Toys, that, that one kid. It's basically like one small child who has a you know, 40, 50 million dollar a year business venture, <laughs> playing with toys. Uh, I mean, you know, don't, like, like, and it, it really is winner take all in a way that other forms of media were not. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it makes me think like, so I have a teenage son and like him and his friends are not really on social media. And so I'm wondering, just going off of what you were just saying, like what do you guys see as the future of social media and kind of along with that, like, what, in the advent of AI, like what do you guys see as the, the future of social media with, um, you know, regular usership? And also, this is probably two questions, but what are platforms' responsibilities when it comes to AI and are they going to even be doing anything? Can we just stipulate no for the second one? <laughs> <laughs> I agree. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, AI is just lowering the barrier to creating content more. I mean, just going back to what you're saying too, um, for years, it's and actually Evan Spiegel wrote actually what I thought was actually a pretty good piece in twenty in twenty seventeen about the Snapchat. Yeah, the sorry the CEO Snapchat of about that exact shift that Jeff is talking about where it's it used to be a much more user driven internet and now we are getting to this like um, very like yeah this top one percent creating all the content for then everybody that consumes it and also that top one percent is increasingly game of like they're sort of just engagement maximizer types. Um, and I think those people are so excited about AI. It's funny, we were having an editorial meeting recently, um, and I was just saying like every single source I talked to in the content creator world has been very excited because I think a lot of them are, feel very overworked and um, they want the ability to create content at scale faster and not have to worry about you know coming up with custom illustrations or custom whatever. I use AI all the time when I make my YouTube videos to certain tools, edit out white space. Like, so in that sense, I think it can be a great creative tool the problem is it's very quickly used to just create spam, you know, garbage content, low quality content, and um, the platforms have no incentive to do it. They do anything about that. You know, a lot of them are even more excited to integrate more AI features into their platforms. So, I was just playing with TikTok's AI music generator now, where since um, they've been pushing it really hard since uh, Universal Music pulled out the music from their music catalog from TikTok. Now TikTok is pushing this thing where um, you, you put in some prompts and it will generate an AI song for you to go along with your video, the vibe of your video or whatever. And I just think we're gonna see more and more of that stuff where you're sort of getting this like middle of the road AI generated content just for you to make more content. Yeah. In terms of how the platforms are responding to it so far, uh, I mean, Meta's all in. It loves the idea of this. Uh, and that's partly because Mark Zuckerberg um, it has always stung him that he was not viewed as a visionary. Uh, he, in fact, did run polling for a number of years uh, in which he would, like, ask, you know, the polling question was, like, you know, like, who's more visionary, like, Jeff Bezos or Mark? <laughs> like, like, literally that level of, uh, of and uh, uh, so it, it, he's, he's sort of, I mean, you know, he leaned heavily into, um, Let's see, first it was Libra and uh, cryptocurrencies, then he got really excited about NFTs, uh, then there was the metaverse, which um, uh, is, if you notice that no one writes about the metaverse that's dead these days, um, I mean, I, I cover safety stuff and I don't have to spend much time writing about the metaverse because no one's in it, so therefore it's very safe. Um, and um, so, it, the Gen AI is now kind of the new thing, uh, and there's just sort of a full arms race on it. I think, look, it's a very similar 
situation to the arrival of social media, which is the line is like, oh, people are good, I'm sure it's gonna end up working well. Like, we're gonna trust the users, uh, even as like voice cloning and uh, non-consensual uh, pornography uh, just, uh, you know, is like the most obvious use cases are pretty terrible. Um, and I also think something that's just is gonna be a problem for, for the platforms, they're all very rules-based. Like, this is sounds ridiculous, but like covering meta, I have reviewed 20 page slide decks for moderators intended to um, describe like just exactly when a butt, a picture of a butt crosses the line into unacceptable territory. Like it is like, you know, they, they have created a million rules on this stuff. Uh, now mind you, do they functionally enforce them? Absolutely not, but it's a rules based system, right? Um, where it is always another line of flow chart. AI obviously overturns that. Like I recall it a year ago having some conversations with their um, their their comm staff being like, so how are you guys gonna deal with, uh, let's see, um, people creating, um, uh, people posting what would be porn if the model had any genitals uh, type <laughs> content. Or like in a sadly not uh, hypothetical uh, example, um, people who were like going huge on the platform, again, huge in a particular community by creating AI images of extremely busty preteens in swimwear. Um, I mean, like you look at the thing and it's just immediately like, oh God, like get this thing the hell off the platform. Does not violate the rules. So like, I think there's gonna be kind of, I don't think we figured out how to use social media particularly well in the first place, much less some of the recommendation systems that are sort of the second layer. And I think the adding on generative AI is in addition to just like swamping the open internet with just crap content um, is uh, going to be, gonna sort of add a little extra layer of complexity. Like even, even for, like I'd be shocked if this hasn't happened to you, Taylor. Like, um, uh, if you go to Amazon, you can either buy my book or you can buy the AI generated summary of my book uh, these days. This exists for basically every item uh, at this point. And it's, wow. it's like, you know, I, I can assure you that, that uh, uh, so I think, I think there's kind of a devaluation of original creative work that comes in on this stuff. Uh, and that's going to be uh, really painful. So I don't know that the, the people who are really excited about the tools, I'm kind of like, be careful what you wish for on that one. Um, okay, well, I, I wanted to ask about um, the content creator industry. Uh, Taylor, I've heard you say that it's a half a trillion dollar industry. I think I'm getting that right. Um, and so it made me think about like some of the people that I follow on Instagram are like, they have a, you know, not a huge following, maybe 10,000 followers, something like that. And, and I've heard them say like, I don't really make that much money doing this. And so it's confusing to me, even after having read your book, which is like, so thorough, um, like how do, how is, does the content industry work for the content creators? Um, how could, like, do, do some people make very little money and then some can make a lot? Like, yeah. like how does that work? Yeah, so content creators are just independent media businesses. That's what they are. So sometimes that's a single person building a media business around sort of their own personality. Um, sometimes it's some of, most of them are sort of interest-based. So like you built a toy review channel or a bike channel or a fashion channel or whatever. Um, and there's just a myriad of ways to monetize. It obviously, I mean, the industry is very synonymous with sponsored content because that was the initial way a lot of people monetize, but subscriptions are huge. Um, you know, products are a big thing. Like now people want to do product lines. Um, and then of course, revenue generated directly from the platforms. All of these platforms have different sort of like creator monetization programs, uh, merchandise, um, shout outs and live events, you know, like they're, all of the ways that sort of traditional media organizations like the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post, you know, figure out monetization, which is usually mixed with subscriptions, advertising, and events, um, that's what these independent media businesses are doing. It's just very hard to build a media business on the internet, especially when you're building it on essentially quicksand, because you're building it on uh, sort of, you have to be on all platforms and kind of navigate the platforms and all their different incentives and ride those waves, also while, while trying to make money. So it's, 
yeah, I mean, you can make millions and millions of dollars, and the tech companies have spread so much propaganda being like, anybody can make it, you know, it's a, it's a meritocracy, when obviously it's not. Um, you know, there's, there's so many different like, ways that people gain things. Um, but uh, most people don't make that much money because most people are not very good at running their own media business, which is very hard to do. Yeah. And a lot of them uh, get into it for the fame aspect, especially. Like, I mean, not that everybody that goes into the content creator industry is interested in that, but I think especially a lot of young people that enter into it, they see the sort of, it is, it's entertainment adjacent, it's celebrity adjacent, and so they kind of, you know, get into it for that. They're not thinking, I'm, well, I want to be a media entrepreneur, you know what I mean? And the ones that do, Ryan's parents, for instance, um, because Ryan is, I think, 11 or 12 now, but, um, you know, or Mr. Beast, or these big names, like, they, they have staff, I mean, Mr. Beast employs, I think, like, 300 people in North Carolina, we, I wrote a story recently where we went to his the campus and everything, um, you know, they're, they're just companies, like any other media company, like BuzzFeed or something, but they're just, they're built around sort of a, a personality. Yeah. Um, okay, and so, you know, I think it's, it's interesting that it's really easy to talk about like all the ways that social media can be harmful, even though we're all on it. Um, but so I'm wondering, like, can either of you, is, do you see ways that social media has not only helped society, but will continue to going forward? Uh, <laughs> I'm, um, I might be, I think, so okay, look, there's, there's kind of a tendency to be like, is social media good or bad? Uh, you know, does it polarize us or not? I, I, these are all kind of questions that are like sort of, you know, I'd say like, I don't know, is the radio good or bad? Does it, pull, it I mean, like it kind of is sort of the wrong way to go across the board. I think there are certain product features that are um, really useful and other ones that are um, almost universally damaging. Um, I think for, uh, you know, if you're talking with the company, the company will um, assume that as a journalist you are a liberal, and they will suggest that uh, the, um, you know, but what about Black Lives Matter or Me Too, uh, as those will be kind of the, um, the things cited as being these like positive social movements that arose. Um, there are, uh, and, and you know, it's like Black Lives Matter did emerge from uh, basically viral outrage, uh, some of it on Facebook's platform, uh, you know, a, a series of, um, you know, remarkably similar and completely avoidable uh, murders of people who did not have that coming to them by the police. And, and so it's really, really good. Uh, they've built systems at this point that are extremely good at making a hashtag blow up. Um, but it really does blow up. This is not how you build a movement or anything orderly. Um, uh, yeah, I think BLM has in some ways some of those hallmarks, which is it got giant, there was a beef on the police movement. Uh, where's the infrastructure? Where are the ballot initiatives? Where are the people running for office on these platforms at said juncture? And like, it's not that they don't exist. They are, there are people out there. But the amount of sort of explosive energy that got harnessed here on things that were then like kind of it just moved on to the next. Like that's kind of a direct result of the way these platforms have been built, which is that like sustained attention is not the goal. It's it's like breaking through for a moment and cresting on that wave. Yeah. Um, and then also, so your reporting was you discovered so many damning things about Facebook, basically, that they had all this research, that they understood a lot of the harms that their platform was causing, but that they weren't doing anything about it. And um, did you see any repercussions to Facebook from the public understanding that? Um, let's see, they, uh, they shut down Instagram kids in the immediate wake of the Facebook file, so that was a, you know, a little thing. Um, yeah, I mentioned this at a previous panel, uh, but the um, for a long time the company was really focused on this metric called Cares About You. It was um, basically just a one question survey that would ask users on a, you know hundreds of thousands of them every day, uh, which is you know does Facebook care about you? It was a tracking survey to check on basically the company's reputation. They realized in the wake of the Facebook files and Francis Haugen, 
that that didn't really matter. That cares about you had absolutely tanked. People hated the company. Uh, I mean, more so than they had at any point since Cambridge Analytica, which was another low point for reputation. Um, and usage did not decline one bit. Uh, in fact, it, I take it back. It recovered after five days uh, of Francis Haugen going, um, uh, appearing in, in front of Congress and going public. So, um, in terms of, there's a lot of sort of regulatory stuff that has been started in Europe that is underway. Uh, you know, in the U.S., there has been pretty much no functional effort to rein this stuff in. There is, at the moment, an effort to do things on child safety focus uh, work. Uh, I mean, I don't know, in terms of fallout from the project. Mark Zuckerberg did take up mixed martial arts for a few months <laughs> when, we started, when, we, when we started publishing that stuff. So maybe that's the uh, biggest impact on Facebook. <laughs> And like, do either of you see any more regulation going forward, or like any safety levers being put into place? I'm very against a lot of the stuff that there's framed as safety because it's not actual safety. And yeah, please talk about that. I mean, I've written a lot about the Kids Online Safety Act and my opposition to it and skepticism around it. Like, I think that instead of addressing the sort of fundamental root cause, which is the business models. At play, they put the you know they want to kind of oh they want to tweak the design in this way or this way, which by the way the companies are just going to thwart. And um, also a lot of it is, a, is is focused around restricting speech online, which I also think is bad. You know what what Meta specifically does, and I've read about this with the long threads too, is like instead of putting it, they don't want to invest in thoughtful moderation, so they're kind of like oh you want us to moderate, all right we're going to block you know all these words. When they rolled out threads, they blocked dozens of words. You couldn't major newsworthy, as the PR person literally said to us, like, will we block newsworthy terms because we can't police this information? Well, what ha from, from searching on threads, what, what that allowed to happen is just basically like all of this stuff is read and checked. It's a, it was a bad system. And, um, you know, a lot of this stuff is framed as, oh, online safety for children. And it's, again, it's, it's not targeting the fundamental business model. It's not, there's, there's no data privacy, comprehensive data privacy reform. Like, I think there's a lot of stuff that even people in Europe have around sort of data privacy protection that we don't have here. There's also an intense focus and scrutiny on TikTok and not nearly amount of that scrutiny on Meta and other, or Twitter or other platforms. So I, I don't have a lot of hope for regulation, but I don't know. I mean, I think we've gone through a, a series of sort of hypotheses as to what's wrong with the platforms. I mean, I think in 2016, it was like Russians. <laughs> and then it was like Cambridge Analytica and psychometric targeting. And, uh, you know, we've sort of continued to move. And then it was, you know, censorship. Um, and uh, I think trying to like think about any of these policies is sort of any of these platforms is like that somehow moderation is going to see things through. More moderation um, is, I, I think, I, I'm, you know, quoting a former Facebook engineer here, uh, whose comment was, uh, "Anytime you have to moderate content, you lose," uh, which is accurate. One, they're terrible at it. Um, uh, I mean, the, the, it, it is remarkable. I'm speaking mostly about Meta, as I think there are some slight, there are other entities that are a little better, uh, like. You can report someone sending a picture of a dick sent to you a dozen times to the company, and they'll be like, "No, we checked it out. It's looking fine." And you're like, "This is this is perhaps the single most obvious like like if a machine has ever learned to recognize a picture, an adult man's penis should really be the first thing that catches." And and they they just can't do it. Um, so I, I think the the stuff that would be great to see. Uh, and I think there's like some pieces of it built into some of the legislation uh, would be uh, things that would perhaps be focused on responsible design. Um, I mean, one would not step foot into a car uh, built, you know, a car or a plane uh, that was built in these fashion. Uh, you know, there's just simply, uh, the thing would one, immediately crash, and two, like, you know, I don't know where to take that metaphor, but um, but uh, it, it, it is not a, um, so the question is like, how much do things get amplified, to what degree, uh, you know, is 
sort of appealing to particular platform virality features, the way to get ahead. Uh, these are things that I think really can distort behavior, uh, and they are not intrinsic to the plat, you know, to social media. It doesn't have to be this way. Um, there are, you know, again, if you were to put together a two percent, say, hit to Instagram growth, you would be able to run, I would say, like probably most of the safety initiatives, uh, things that are intended, or, you know, poor, poor quality initiatives that, that um, the platform has, stuff to, uh, you know, encourage original non-stolen content, that would come at some hit. Again, stolen content does well. Uh, so if you, if you get rid of some of it, you at least have a better ecosystem built. Yeah. I worry about some of that stuff, though, because it, it, as it, it ends up being implemented, it often just hurts news organizations. Like, I think as journalists, I, I just, it's like what they've done to the business of journalism has been so abhorrent, and it's so often used against us, especially kind of some of those things. I don't know. I've had, like, I mean, news, I've written a lot about news content creators, and they're constantly getting thwarted. They're trying to amplify yeah. certain coverage, right? But then that's a read, whatever. But, um, but yeah, I totally agree. I think the design, we, we need to sort of fix some the design and also more competition. You know, there was a world where we had a lot more, especially in the early 2010s, there was a lot more competition for these products. It's extremely hard. I think it's very telling that the only social platform that has really given Face, Meta, and Google a run for their money in the past nearly decade is TikTok, which is also owned by a multi-billion dollar tech conglomerate in China. So I think... That's the level of resources, like actually, as Georgina, I think, at the Wall Street Journal reported, like TikTok spent a billion dollars in 2019 on app download ads alone. Like that's, to get traction against these major companies, that's how much resources you have to have. So I, yeah, we can do something about that as well. Um, I did want to bring up one more thing from your book, Jeff, and then we'll go to questions, but um, there was, this is like one part of the book that really stood out is when, so Facebook is like hands off for, for most of it, but then, they do start censoring um, after January 6th, you say that you that it seemed like they might have even stopped a new political party from forming. And so I kind of would hope, I, I was hoping you would just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. And why then? Why did they decide to censor that? Yeah, because uh, they knew they'd fucked up. Um, <laughs> uh, so, uh, excuse language, uh, <laughs> but um, so the philosophy internally from the people who know the platform well uh, and to you know, sort of we're in charge of the engineering and data science work here, is that you can either build for stability or you can build for virality. Um, that uh, the faster your platform goes, first of all, the less time you've got to respond when suddenly it starts heading toward a ditch. Uh, and second of all, the more the problematic stuff really does well. Like it turns out that even just slightly slowing viral content will drop the percentage of known misinformation on the platform by a double digit percent. Uh, all you gotta do is just slow it down a little bit. Not suppress it, not like, you know, make it go away, not even, you know, but just not promote it quite as aggressively as you were previously. That'll do it. So in the, I think, the run up to 2020, um, the company built a whole system of tools that were known as break the glass measures, uh, intended to convey that, uh, you know, to be used in cases of all out panic. And um, these were developed in um, what used to be known as the third world. Uh, Meta was not going to try any of this stuff in, uh, in the US or in Europe. However, um, uh, in, in Burma, in Ethiopia, uh, in Kenya during election protests, they would basically put down these stabilizing measures uh, only for the period of time when there was a true crisis at hand. Um, but Things like entities that had repeatedly violated Facebook's rules would get a little less viral. Comment threads that were full of hate terms would be shut down automatically. Uh, the invitation, like you could no longer invite 2,000 people to groups per day, uh, you know, which is something that in the wake of, say, bombings in Sri Lanka a few years back, basically you went, within 48 hours you had about 15% of the country, at least in terms of the user base, uh, uh, was in a group that was just like full out devoted to hate memes. Uh, and no one was in charge of it. It was just like, so there's basically just things that were stable and slow, uh, were kind of the thing they imposed. So they did that right after the 2020 election, um, uh, when, you know, there was sort of 
starting to be sort of riots outside of voting tabulation centers. Uh, and then two days, two or three days later, um, they started lifting it. Um, and uh, by early December, they had lifted every safety measure they had in place on the platform uh, post-election. So this is all in front of January 6th. And in fact, Mark Zuckerberg had decreed that um, even studying the hashtag stop the steal and election denial, like much less trying to shut it down, even tracking it, didn't want to get into it. Um, because if there was a problem, they might have to do something, and they just did, they wanted to stay out of it. Obviously, January 6th comes around. Um, you know, the January 6th was not planned on Facebook. However, Facebook was an integral part of getting uh, tens of thousands of people who were convinced of the most laughably bullshit conspiracy theories into uh, the National Mall, a short walk from the Capitol. Uh, now, what happens after that is, you know, we're all some planning and all of that, but this was just something where they had um, been an integral part of sort of convening that mass of angry and deeply misinformed people. And in the, um, in the wake of it, uh, rather than slowing down the platform on a longer term basis, you know, just sort of putting those measures in place on a permanent basis, they um, simply came up with the strategy of murdering new versions of that same group uh, in their crib. So like, it turns out the anti-vaccine and the uh, and the QAnon and uh, the Stop the Steal and the militia people. Functionally, the overlap in those communities was like extremely high. This is the same group of, of folks who are ultra active, ultra aggressive, and really good at the platforms, uh, at manipulating the platforms. So what the company did was they saw that they were banding together around a new hashtag called the Patriot Party, which was supposed to be a splinter group from the Republican Party that was going to reject the Republican Party's weak need response to a stolen election. Uh, and they murdered that thing. If you use that in a post, uh, hashtag Patriot Party, uh, probably not only was that post not gonna go anywhere, but your account was probably not gonna go anywhere for a little while either. Like they weren't gonna shut you down, it was just gonna land with your thud. And they developed this sort of, and it's all very clever, um, they basically called information corridors. They would um, see how a particular viewpoint spread. There'd be the sort of the original, the creators, then their lieutenants, then the people who bridged and amplified that message to other communities, and then there'd be just sort of like the regular schmoes who were like, let's say, QAnon curious. Uh, and uh, it turns out that there is a playbook you can use to dismantle that. You knock out the, uh, the leaders, uh, you heavily feature limit, um, basically disable temporarily all of their lieutenants, because otherwise the lieutenants step up and try to take over. The bridgers get muted to hell, uh, and then everyone who is kind of open to those uh, messages, you prevent them from connecting with each other and start serving them a whole bunch of banal like content. You know, it's like, oh hi, were you were you interested in the possibility of lizard people? Uh, okay, like, how about watching some sports? You know, would be basically the response. So this is like obviously deeply interventionist, like, uh, and a level, and it's something that I think of like people of any political philosophy should be. It's scary. It really is like basically using every bit of data about a movement online against it, uh, and it was you know I think arguably quite necessary at that point, given that there was an effort to basically recreate January 6th um, uh, again, and you know, try to make another attempt at trying to stop the certification of the election, I mean, the election was certified, trying to stop the, shall we say, the, the peaceful transfer of power, yeah. and they, they, um, they shut it down. And that's unfortunately what they have to do uh, if they're going to have a platform that works the way that is as speedy, as um, heavy on amplification as it is. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, that could be a good debate topic. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll go to questions. Um, does anybody have a question they want to ask? Yeah, go ahead. Question just for Taylor, mostly. Um, he's writing about social media as a sort of real-time historian, or recent history historian in anyway, which seems to get deleted all the time. You know, Insta stories like 24 hours, Snapchat, Yeah. 
Yeah, um, it was actually so difficult, and I could never have written my book without the Internet Archive, which is a phenomenal resource. It is a nonprofit. Elon Musk said my family owns it. They do not. It's actually completely <laughs> not affiliated with me at all. Um, it's just an amazing nonprofit that is organized on cataloging the Internet. And, um, you know, they, they doc, they, especially with the early like blogs that I wrote about, like I could not have written this book about it. And um, what I found actually most frustrating or difficult was sort of the, it was more between 2010 and 2015, there were all these digital media sites that have since wiped their archives. And so if it, there weren't these archived versions of those articles, I couldn't have found a lot of the sources that I found and people that I found. Um, it, because it's just, yeah, I also relied a lot on like drama channels and tea account type pages because they aggregate things that content creators have not, that removed or whatever. And so when I was writing about early things like that, it was, it was really helpful. I also talked to a lot of just like primary sources. I interviewed almost 600 people for my book, so there's a lot of people that were there as well in those early days. Um, yeah, on the beat, but yeah, shout out to the Internet Archive. I want them to stay in business because they're really, it's just, there's so your family owns so. them. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> For my own nonprofit. But uh, no, I mean, I just think as journalists, we're, we're losing a lot of really important source material. Yeah. Taylor, I recently listened to an episode of the podcast Search Engine, where last October you were a guest. <laughs> and in that episode, you talked about how you had hired Frank, yes. who is a content consumer to kind of take care of your socials for about a week. So you could kind of step back from that. I've got two questions. Do you still hire a Frank periodically? His name is Frank. <laughs> He's 22 years old. <laughs> the second question is, with the rise of AI, don't you see that Frank's job can be outsourced to the robot? Yeah, I actually talked to somebody at Meta about this. So for people that don't know, I did a story that was one of those bit stories that we do sometimes as tech writers where um, I was writing about the pressure to consume content because, you know, specifically Instagram stories. There's, we all just have so many Instagram stories in our feed and I felt like I was missing a lot. So I hired this 22, 23 year old uh, assistant to basically watch thousands of my Instagram stories for the week and then um, summarize them and give me at the end of the week this sort of like summarized report of what all of my friends had posted. And it was sort of like about just how much content is out there and how difficult it is to keep up. And, um, and also just like the algorithmic, you know, what served you algorithmically versus whatever. And um, no, I did have to pay, I paid Frank, I think it was $200, which I was able to expense, but it's not probably something that I want to make a regular expense of mine, so I did not. But I, um, you know, I do think that there is a need to kind of summarize, like I think that we are all expected and there's a lot of social pressure to consume content or, you know, oh, you didn't see my latest vacation or oh, I got married, did you see I posted about it, you know? So um, I wish that there, with AI, there were better ways. I mean, I still wish I could get like my weekly Instagram stories report where I could just get them, you know, if anybody posts about getting an engagement, that's in the little engagement section. So it's kind of like a, maybe a millennial thing because when we had Facebook, really, I think you're a millennial too, I, but when we had Facebook really early, it used to like, you used to really be able to keep up with all your friends and now it's increasingly impossible. Shout out to my friends. Yeah. Um, for Jeff, so yeah, I've considered for that reason to keep up with friends joining Facebook. I have managed to not do that. Um, sometimes, you know, I want to see something about a band and it's like they block me they you know you you can sort of see but they keep you out and you know it's tempting to get signed on but you know they keep coming up in the news having done despicable things and I said well okay I'll consider joining Facebook if they can stay out of the news of not having done something despicable for two years so my question, Jeff, is no. ever <laughs> if that's if that's a rule, then, then no, that is going to be very hard. Look, I think I think there is the company does sometimes say, ah, oh, you know, we're going to you know receive, we're going to get help uh, from you know everyone, uh, you know, under all circumstances. And there's some element of truth here to that. Like there is, um, you know, both Democrats and Republicans are thoroughly convinced the platform is uh, is screwing them over at every opportunity. Um, uh, but in terms of, you know, a, a lack of scandal, um, I think it's extremely hard when you are blindly recommending content, which is the system here, right? They're not recommending, they're not recommending bands to you because 
they think that you, uh, you know, are oh, going to like the band. band. In fact, they're, they're like really not, the fact that it's even music, it's not really even something they focus on. It's that there's a pattern of behavior that you and other people like you, who you know, act in a similar way, uh, you know, should recommend things. So it's, it's, you're gonna end up with a whole bunch of really awful stuff. I mean, I've, I've recently been doing child safety. Uh, it turns out that um, there is no clearer signal that you can send to an algorithm uh, than following a few preteen gymnasts. And that just basically translates to, um, I'm interested in children sexually. Now, does, should it be that way? Absolutely not, right? But like that said, if you look at the community, the algorithm is very correctly guessing that people who follow a lot of little girls have, on average, really untoward interests, and it is going to try that door. It's a very high, if you aren't interested, maybe it'll back off at some point. But the first thing it's going to do is just to push in that direction. Uh, and you know, really start pumping that stuff to you. And if you pause or you know, uh, look at a post for even a second, that will be viewed as a positive signal to serve you more. So like, there's no way that system isn't going to produce regular outrages. It's just built in. I mean, now Facebook 2007, where like you follow your friends and you see their posts in chronological order, it's very safe. Maybe it's so boring that no one would use it. In fact, that probably is the case at this juncture. But like, it's a much less scandal-prone thing. Thanks so much. We're going to leave you, it Jen. there. Thank you to our authors. They are going to be at the sales and book signing 